Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And typically joining me today would be the governor, the mayor, the head of Beckerville, USA, Mr. Michael Becker. But unfortunately, he is on another due diligence assignment, so he is unable to attend the podcast. So sitting in, one of our friends, one of our guests, the loan officer for Old Capital, Mr. Ricardo Hinonosa. Ricardo, how are you? Good, Paul. How are you? I'm doing well. What's going on in the Old Capital world these days? So we're staying busy, really gearing up for our big annual conference. It's going to be going on October 25th. So trying to put together the best content for that event is, is primarily what we're up to today or what's been going on recently. You'll want to be there. We'll probably have close to 1,000 people there. Mm -hmm. subject matter experts across the industry. Our lending partners will be there, top brokers, property management companies, but primarily investors. So this is this is an investor BNC apartment driven conference and the networking will be fantastic. Yeah, it's an absolute fantastic conference to go to. Again, it's our annual conference here in Dallas. Find a way to get on a Southwest Airlines or American Airlines plane to come down to Dallas and uh, visit with us. Remember last year we had Roger Stahl back. We had it at the at AT and T Stadium. Yes, they that large AT and T Dallas Cowboy Stadium. So it was a lot of fun. We had probably about seven hundred fifty people there the year before. We had uh, Rob O'Neill. Rob O'Neill came in and talked a little bit about teamwork and putting teams together. We buy these properties not as individuals. We buy them in, with a group of team members. Whether it is your attorney or your banker or your CPA or your PPM attorney that puts together the syndication documents. We buy these as a group. So Rob did a great job of kind of in telling us a little bit how he got into the middle of Pakistan and was able to say goodbye to Osama bin Laden. So that was <laughs> that was a good good conference. So come see us on October twenty fifth. Other things to remember, if you have a question for Ask Mike Mondays, go into the old capital podcast dot com website. Ask your question. We'll try to read that on the air and have Michael answer that question. Other thing is, too, is that uh, download the 17-page white paper report on multifamily financing. We want you to kind of get a little bit better understanding about what's going on in financing and how to put these these transactions together. So go on to oldcapitalpodcast.com and download that. Today in the podcast, we have some friends, some friends we've known for a long period of time. And so I think what we're going to try to do is get as much knowledge as we can from these folks, and hopefully that will be good for you to kind of understand a little bit about uh, where they came from so maybe that uh, some of their, their tidbits of information can help you get into the apartment industry. So in the podcast today, it's Alan and Laurel Beezer. Guys, how are you? Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being in there. And, and now you guys, uh, you were at the Old Capital Conference last year and the year before. That's correct. What did you guys think about that? Oh, we loved them both. It was a great opportunity. It's so great to be a uh, real estate investor in the state of Texas and be involved with Old Capital. There's so much that we can gain value from. So we appreciate the kind words. I'm going to turn over the, to the Master Inquisitor, Mr. Ricardo <laughs> Hinojosa, to kind of talk a little bit about what's going on with the Beezers. Hey, guys. Well, thanks for joining us. First of all, you guys have been part of the team for a while. Good friends. So let's just start with a little bit of background. Background about yourselves, and then kind of ease into how you got started into real estate, and we'll go from there. Great. Well, Alan's background is he has a BA degree. It's in general studies, but it's with accounting and zoology and something else I forget. And he got a he has a executive MBA also, and he has been in the dairy business for thirty thirty four years 34, today. Thirty four years today. And today, congratulations. Yes, yes. <laughs> known as the milkman. Of known real as estate. the milkman of real estate. There's <laughs> yes. there's a lot of accountants. There's a lot of engineers, but there's only one milkman. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so that's his background, and he's really good at reading reports and the financial part of that. We have moved all over the country with his mostly his job. My background is in bookkeeping. I worked for a software company for 17 years in bookkeeping, and I'm also a Red Cross certified swim instructor, have been for about 12 years. 
So you teach the young kids and the old kids how to swim. Correct. In the pool. And, and how many kids do you currently have as students? Uh, about 32 kids a day. 32 kids learning how to swim a day. Wow. Mm-hmm. That is uh, good Good for you. Yes, thank you. It saves people a lot of time. So let's talk about how you got started in real estate. And I know you've got a, a long real estate background. Let's start there. Okay. So actually, both of our parents had homes with basement apartments. So we grew up our whole lives having that in our thought process that this was a good thing to have. As soon as we got married, we never rented. We bought a house that had a basement apartment. And we continued to rent that out while I finished college. Once I finished college, we moved to another home and kept that first house with the basement apartment and the upstairs and continued to have single family Homes pretty much off and on up until about the last three years. And we still have three, but Mm -hmm. uh, we've moved on. So about three or four years ago, you started looking into multifamily. And I remember talking to you back then. So talk a little bit about how multifamily came to be and what you've been doing over the last three to four years. Well, we had moved to Texas for his job and I started listening to the radio. And I was driving home from church and listening to it every Sunday and getting more annoyed and more annoyed. And I'd even called in a few times and asked some questions. Annoyed why? Because we had our house paid off. We were saving 20% of our income. And we had a meeting with our financial advisor who told us we either needed to work longer, make more, or save more if we wanted to retire and have a decent income to be able to live a good lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And it made me so mad that one day, after, right after we met with him, I listened to Steve Davis on the phone, mm-hmm. and the I radio. called Alan on the radio, yeah. and I called Alan and said, we are going to this class. We're not going to buy any CDs. We're not going to buy any books, but we are going to go to this class and learn. And we were blown away. We had invested in a multifamily deal in New York City, of all places, with our son-in-law. And we really didn't know how it worked. All we knew was that you kept it, you refinanced it every couple of years, you got your money back, and you still owned the asset. We didn't quite understand how it worked. So this was years ago that you got into the investment in New York City? No, that was about a year before we joined Lifestyles. Okay, yeah. So So about three plus years ago. So you were given an opportunity to invest in a a multifamily transaction in New York City? in New York City. Correct. But you invested in, into it, but you really didn't understand what the investment was. Right. Correct. But you read through the PPM, and it was in kind of a different language that you're typically used to. You're used to single family, and I understand we put money into the single family, and I usually own and operate by myself the single family, but now I'm in a, in a partnership with a bunch of people, and I don't know any of those partners in the deal, and I don't know where the property is located at because I'm not going to go drive it up in New York City. But so it was kind of a leap of faith that if my son-in-law was going to do it, maybe I would do it and kind of see what that came out to be. So how much money did you put in that first investment? 50,000. So 50,000, it was, you know, kind of a flyer uh, on the deal. Our son-in-law has done this for years and he was in about 14 or 16 multifamilies in New York City and he had done very, very well. So we had been watching him. Didn't quite understand it, but knew he was doing very well, so we took the leap. Took the only- leap of faith. Yeah, so you're driving home, you're listening to Steve Davis on the radio, and Steve's kind of talking about the same thing, talking about you know possibly putting money into real estate, and you had just had a conversation with your CPA saying, hey, <laughs> you got to either work longer or work smarter, and maybe real estate may be the answer. That's kind of the conclusion you came to after listening to Steve Davis. So Steve Davis at the time was with Lifestyles Unlimited, and Lifestyles Unlimited has a radio show that comes out, I think, every day. And they, they kind of talk a little bit about single family and multifamily. So how come you didn't stay in the single family space? So we could see that the single family space was good and it was profitable. But and, and by learning the right techniques, we could do it right. You know, we could not make mistakes yeah. like we had in the past. But we could also see that the economies of scale were really not there for single family. For right. us to really grow our wealth exponentially, we needed to become involved in multifamily. And you talked a little bit about education. I mean, you went to undergraduate, then you went got your executive MBA. So you believe in education. Absolutely. And so one of the things when you get into multifamily stuff, you really need to have specific education. Because a lot of people 
they're not familiar with that this space. They've never done it. Maybe I mean you work for a large corporation that's transferred to you all over the country. You know your industry, you're in it, but now you're you're making a leap of faith by putting money into your son in law's partnership, whoever was sponsoring that. So you felt if you did it yourself, you better get yourself educated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so tell us a little bit of, about that. Where did you go to get educated and did you find value in that? Oh, wow. Yes. I am not even sure we could do this if we did not have this education. We joined Lifestyles. We've gone on all the road trips. We've taken all of their classes. We go to all the old capital events and we learn so much, meet so many people. We have listened to a lot of different real estate podcasts as well. We've just really delved in. We just went all feet and hands once we joined is everything we could learn so, in the multifamily. So when you got into the multifamily educational piece, tell me a little bit about some of the things that Lifestyles did for you to educate you. Well, they have a mentor who sits down and meets with you and you go through your finances, go through your goals, and they talk about what your end result would want to be. You also meet with a lot of passives who can tell you how, you know, what to look for in another lead. They offer all kinds of classes. They have a whole learning bridge that you can do anything from learning how to read a PPM to evaluating a deal to even how to get in contact with other syndicators. So we did a lot with the learning on that. They yeah, do there's road probably trips a where they hundred hours of online learning. Right. And they have road trips so that you go and visit the property and you can see what's happening, what they're doing, what does value add, so that we learned every time we went. We were very involved. I think you guys did a great job of taking advantage of some of the networks, whether it be lifestyles, our events. Mm -hmm. You guys are always there. You know, Paul and Mike talk about it all the time about this is so much a relationship business, not a business you can do behind a desk. Right. You've got to get out, meet people, build those relationships. And you guys have done a great job of that. You'd mentioned the roadmap that you guys put together a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Talk about that specific to multifamily because you, you really followed a path of I'm going to get educated, then I'm going to do some passive investments. Right. And then do something on your own. So talk a little bit about what that, that roadmap looked like and how you've executed against that. Okay. Yeah, we could see that multifamily worked. And so we didn't hesitate to get involved. We are invested in 23 passive deals, roughly 3,200 doors. Let me make sure I understand. 20, <laughs> 23 passive transactions. Yeah. Wow. And what period of time again? A couple of years. Maybe okay. two and a half. That's yeah. pretty darn good. Yeah. Wow. That's that's. that's Amazing. Well, we saw the map and we believed in it, so it was okay. Why mess around? Let's we jumped right let's, in. Let's get on with it. So learn, grow, get invested, and then we were KPs on four of those deals. So we learned a little bit more that way. So, so you had an end in mind with those passive investments. I, I know you you were a little more active than your just passive investor that wants to just sit back and collect money which is fantastic. You wanted to learn. I wanted to, yeah. So talk about Absolutely. those partnerships and those relationships that you built with some of those, these lead syndicators that allowed you to do that. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great point. We were able to uh, build some relationships with some great lead syndicators that uh, allowed us the opportunity to learn about how they put together the financials, how they manage their business, mm -hmm. and uh, just the, the opportunity of being in that many deals with different people, different lead syndicators, gave us the opportunity to see how they operated. What did we like about this? How did they communicate? What didn't we like about this other person? And did they not communicate well? Did they the leave reports some, not the, out the, on the time. reports not out on time? Give me an idea of how much money out of 23, what was the low, what was the high in terms of money that you put into these deals? Okay. So the very lowest was actually 25000 We We did that on a couple of deals where they wanted our net worth and liquidity as a KP. Everything else was um, anywhere up until probably 100000 was the most we put into a single deal. So, Ricardo, tell us a little bit about KP and, and what they did as a KP. Why mm -hmm. is that important? Yeah, so when we're putting these deals together, this is a team sport. We talk about it all the time. And one of the key pieces to financing is making sure we've got enough net worth, liquidity, and experience amongst the KP group. 
the individuals that are signing on a loan. And in a few instances, individuals leveraged the Beezer's net worth and liquidity to help pull a deal together. So we've got to have a net worth equal to or greater than the loan amount. We've got to have post-closed liquidity of at least 10%. And they were willing and able to sign on how many deals? Did you case four? Four Four deals. Mm -hmm. Two Freddie and two Fannie loans. Right. And what that did for them is it gave them a wealth of experience, actual experience, but then experience in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's eyes, which is helping you down the road. So again, explain. So they were just one part of being a key principal, and then they were supporting kind of the deal sponsor, the lead investor in the deal. Exactly. And maybe the lead investor did not have enough net worth mm-hmm. by themselves, but they brought the Beezers in to kind of mitigate to get additional net worth, additional liquidity into the transaction, right? Exactly. So that's great. So then how many of those transactions out of 23 were, were say, value-added, and how many were stabilized, and what's kind of the difference in your mind between those two? So we always tried to go for at least a hybrid. There are very few just real straight yield plays, which to us, a yield play is going to start cash flowing from day one. There are some of those that even though they start cash flowing from day one unexpectedly, um, they still had some nice value add components. So those were what we call a hybrid. We are in several deep value yeah. deals mm-hmm. so that they have then refinanced. Harder to come by. They are than, harder to come by. Yeah. But I would say the majority of ours are hybrid. Yeah. So and we've had some that have sold and some that have refinanced and we just got one a check last night from a deep value play where we got 80% of our money back. How about the cases that you got no money back or you lost money? Have you, have you come across that? We've never lost money. So and, and right now you haven't lost any money? In- no, we haven't had any of our deals go bad or even questionable at this point. We have some that are not paying any dividends yet, yeah. and they thought they would at about a year, and they still are not, but they are still doing okay. And, you know, one was a fire that has had to stop their distributions because they had a fire. Yep. Another one, it's just a, a different market. And so they're working on that, but we haven't had any that we have been very, very concerned about or that we have lost money on. Any guidance as from a, from a passive standpoint, choosing a deal? I mean, a, a lot of people listening are looking at a ton of deals. Any great question, you know, key, key guidance from a passive standpoint? For us, it was about more the the lead investor or the syndicator than it was the deal. Yeah. Right? I mean, the deal can be really good, but if you get a bad syndicator, it's still going to be bad. Right. But if you get the right guy, the right couple, the right gal, then they can usually take something and and get through those hard times because every property is going to have some ups and downs. and. And they can guide you through that and, and, and take you on to where you want to be at the end. We talked to a lot of other passives yes. who would tell us who had been a good lead for them, who was a good communicator, who got their reports out on time, who really let us know up front if there was an issue with something, who was at the property, you know, who was running their property management, keeping on tabs with the property management, whether they were doing it or whether they weren't doing it. So the passives really help. What are like maybe one or two of the bad <laughs> deals that you don't like in the partnerships? You know, lack of communication, lack of distributions. What are some of the things that you would say that you would have heartburn with that you are going to try to avoid in the future running your own deal? You know, I think it's really comes down to the communication. As long as people tell you, hey, there's a problem. Hey, there's an issue that, that that's happened. We understand that. We know things happen. Yeah. But it's the guys or gals that it's it's the syndicator that kind of hides it, or basically they just don't communicate well, what, what what the issues are, and they go dark. Yeah. 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 Has that happened? Uh, not to a big degree with us, but we know of some others that it has, where you know they try to get a hold of the syndicator and they don't get any response for months and. Yeah. It's 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 really scary that part. But for us, we've been very fortunate. Even though even the ones that aren't doing as well as we would like, we still get some form of communication. And and you have invested in, into mostly all lifestyles transactions. Or have you gone outside? There's a couple that are outside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the ones with lifestyles, as, as an example, they monitor 
and see what's going on. So they're almost like a, the due diligence checklist for right. making sure that the people that are involved in their program are actually doing what they've said they're going to do right. and trying to. So there's there's a, a high threshold to get into the lifestyles to be a because a, a lead syndicator and and then after you've taken all the money there's kind of a high threshold to do what you said you're going to do. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And we appreciate that as passive investors because it really protects us and our investment to make sure that they do all the things that they're supposed to be doing. That's great. Yeah. Now, Lifestyles has a code of conduct that you sign as a lead, mm -hmm. and you agree to follow these rules and to be good to your passives. So that has been a good protection. So let's get into the first deal you did on your own Okay, as a lead. So that has happened recently. Is that um, something that you wanted it to do? Is, is that was the game plan originally when you got into this business? Were you thinking about, well, I've made all these passive investments. Now I'm going to do my own deal. Was that something that was predetermined in your head that you wanted to do? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always been a person that liked to be involved and keep myself busy. And, and that's one reason why we got so involved with lifestyles. If, if we're in it, let's be in it all the way. And I want some control over my own destiny. Yep. So as we got involved with, with passive deals, I think, as you say, what was our goal right at first? I think our, our goals changed three times in the first year, Yeah. right? So, but as we got further into it, it was interesting because I think before we decided that we wanted to be syndicators, we had other people, friends that saying, you're going to be lead sometime, yeah. you know? And then the further you got into it, then it was like, I, I think I'm, I would really enjoy this. Yeah. So let's jump into the first yeah. transaction yeah. that you did. Tell us a little bit about how'd you find it? Interesting, you know, is the 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 first deal. You guys talk about this all the time. It's it's a relationship business, and we were still fairly new. You know, we didn't have those relationships totally set up. We we had developed some with with Ricardo and you know some property management people and accountants and CPAs and lawyers and all some that kind of, of stuff, brokers. right? But some of the brokers, but but when you're first up to bat. Nobody knows what you're going to do. So it, it took about nine months and looking at a lot of deals before we we found our first deal. And there were a number that we won best and final. And then 30 minutes later, we're told, sorry. The other guy came in with $250,000 hard money day one with 30 days and no due diligence required. and Cash. Cash. Close in 30 days. Yeah, that does happen. So let's set, set yeah. the, the table on this one. So you wanted 150, 200 doors of your first transaction? <laughs> yes, yes, we did. We, we, we wanted 150 or 200 doors and we, and we bought 11. <laughs> um, but it was interesting how we found it. You know, you, it, it's that relationship business deal yeah. with uh, lifestyles. They have some rules about how you have to go after a property. And we had our, uh, buying broker call us up the night before they had heard this property was going to go out on the market. And so we were able to kind of put ourselves in a good position to uh, go after it. So was the game plan really to, to do a kind of a smaller deal and kind of put your big toe in the, in the bathtub to kind of figure out if this is the business I want to get into instead of trying to right. get into 150 to 200 doors. Yeah, and exactly right. We looked at 50, we looked at 33, we looked at 16s, we looked at pretty much the whole gamut. We really didn't even think about looking at an 11. But uh, when the opportunity came up, it was like, I think this could be a great opportunity. Let's yeah. let's look at it. So, yeah, it was a little smaller than we originally wanted. But I remember talking about it when it came up. And you looked at it from a little bit of a different lens on, hey, it's small, but we can really use this to learn. Yes, exactly. So talk a little bit more about that. Well, we knew we would be self-managing. When it's a property that small, you're going to be self-managing. And we thought this is an opportunity to learn everything from the ground up on managing and running a property so that then we can go further and get a larger one next time. So paint a picture of what this transaction, this, what this property looks like. I mean, it's 11 doors. Where is it located at? When was it built? Tell us a little bit about the submarket. Okay. It's a great submarket. Irving is fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Great C and B class, working class folks, right? Right. It's great to have a group of people that are anxious to give you a third of their income every single month. Yeah. The deal itself was a 1963 asset that was all townhome style. Mm -hmm. So we liked that. 
So they have upstairs or downstairs, or uh-huh. downstairs, exactly. upstairs type of a. They're all two story, yep. roughly all the same, about nine hundred square feet, two bedrooms, one and a half baths. Had a nice little back door patio, and so that was like eleven by fifteen. So that that was nice and fenced in. So that was a plus. They all had washer dryer hookups. It had been well maintained by the previous owners. They'd done a good job with that, but it had a good reputation. It had a good reputation. So it wasn't a problem that you had to go in there to change the the name of the property and and change the tenant base. The previous ownership group had done a great job or had done a good, good job putting it together. And, uh, you know, it was a stabilized asset. Mm -hmm. It was a stabilized asset. It was a hundred percent occupied. It was run very conservatively is, is how we would put it. Yeah, and it's next to my favorite Italian restaurant in Irving. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Angelo's. very good. <laughs> Angelo's, my, yeah. my favorite. Again, Irving is between Dallas and Fort Worth. That probably has a couple hundred thousand people in, in uh, the suburb itself. It's uh, where the Dallas Cowboys used to play before they were brought over to Arlington, Texas. And this is the southern portion of Irving. And Alan's right. It is a good, hard, working class, blue-collar area that these folks are happy to be a tenant in the building. So, I mean, uh, you've gotten a... A nice area closer to schools, and and uh, it's a it's a good little property. It's a good training wheels property. I Absolutely imagine. perfect. Yeah. 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 So when did you buy it? We bought it in September of last year, of last so year. 2018. Excellent. Yes. And going into it, you mentioned it was performing well, but what was the game plan? Where did you see opportunity? What? Um, how much rehab did you put in? Okay, we had uh, set aside seventy thousand dollars worth of rehab. We wanted to give it a facelift. Like Laurel mentioned, it was run very conservatively. Mm-hmm. From day one, our plan was let's let's get in there, let's repaint the building, let's give it a facelift and make it pop so that people see it. It's it's not on a main road, right? but you can see it now from the main road. Mm-hmm. We also had some opportunities that we saw on some of the expenses and also on some of the income opportunities. So that was our goal really from the start is to maybe take that up to that next level. Yeah, they were not doing any rubs at all on the property. And with washer dryer hookups, we knew that we could definitely implement some water rubs for sure on that property. So you manage the property. Yes, sir. And how is that going? It's great now. It was a real challenge right at first. We had a new software package that we know we were guinea pigs on. Resman had changed their rules and regulations that they would not do smaller properties. So we Mm -hmm. had to use a new software that had all kinds of glitches and did not integrate well with screening or with Blue Moon or, you know, with any of the software, other packages that we needed to use. So it was a challenge to learn that and do all of the rehab and the screening and everything that is entailed with running your own property. In addition, we had 60% of our residents either renew or move out the first 90 days. And it was during September, October, November, December, the, the worst part of the leasing season. And it wasn't because they moved out. Most of them renewed, actually. Sure. But they all came up for renewal at that same time. So we were rehabbing. We were dealing with all of the learning curve that there is. Right. There's so much we didn't know we didn't know. Plus, then all the rehab and the lease renewals. And how much equity did you have? I'm going to jump back to the transaction itself. How much equity did you have to raise in this deal? And how many partners did you have in this deal? So we only had to raise 360000 Okay. And um, we have 17 partners, and that's a lot for a small deal. But we had so many people that were friends that wanted to be in the deal that we actually made so that there was and, a maximum. And, that's a, and that becomes a problem, I think, within lifestyles too. Yeah. Just because you've been in it for a number of years, and people know you, they like you, they they see how conservative you guys have yeah, been. Right. You've invested in their deals. Now they want to turn around and invest in your deals to a right. certain extent. And now you put up the flag, I need three, four hundred thousand dollars and then you could fill it in, in ten minutes. Correct. Right. And then you're thinking about, you know, hundred thousand dollar minimum? No. What was your minimum our maximum, maximum. was twenty five thousand dollars. Maximum. That anybody could yeah, which is nobody does that. But yeah. 20,000. 20, 20, well, we lowered it to 20 so that we so could, we could get, get a few more, more people, people in. in but. Yeah. We felt very strongly 
that we wanted to let some first time people in yes. and a lot of people don't have a lot to invest. Sure. So we wanted to allow a few people in that had not been in any deals before and let them in with a small amount. So our smallest amount was 10, 10,000. Wow. And we literally just drew drew names and names out of a hat. We, we, we had commitments for three times what we needed to raise. So you had to hurt some people's feelings yes. so you couldn't yes. get them in that deal. But it was awful. we made sure everybody knew they had a chance, right? Yeah. That we, we'd, we'd pull some names out of the hat at the end and sorry. Good problem to have. Good problem Great to have. Great problem yeah. to have. Yeah. So you mentioned all the work. So I know a lot of people get into this business or, or think they want to get into this business and hey, it's, it's passive investing. You're going to sit back and collect rents. But it doesn't sound like that was the case. I mean, you essentially took on a new job yes. when you yes. self-managed this property. Talk a yes. little bit about the, the how intense that was. It was very intense the first two or three months. We were both learning the software. He does all of the reporting. I do all the day-to-day. And it was just making, you know, anytime you deal with people, you have every kind of circumstance you can imagine. And so screening people was an education itself on, even though we have parameters set up, there's always exceptions. Mm -hmm. And just dealing with all the different people, and it's a high traffic, high area. They had been advertising on Craigslist, and we changed and did it on Zillow. I cannot tell you how many hundreds of people called to find out about our apartments and how many showings we were doing. So just by changing it from Craigslist to Zillow, you saw the number of people that wanted to rent a unit with from you guys was exponentially larger. Yes, and it was a, a different clientele. I think that it was just a little bit higher quality. Higher quality. Higher quality. Mm-hmm. They um, had a computer, so they were a little bit more tech savvy, obviously, than yeah. somebody who just saw it on Craigslist and called on the phone. It, the area is just very, very, because there's all these working class people, they all want a place to live. And sure. the place started, it looks nice. It's very clean. It's in a great area. There's a bus line up the street. And we just, we stood out as a nice place. And we had several of our residents recommending people. We just mm-hmm. were inundated with people wanting to see our product. And we put pictures of our rehabbed units, we decided to rehab the units all universally. They were all, six of them had been rehabbed to some degree in Mm -hmm. different ways they had experimented. And we decided to go uniform, get them all rehabbed the same way. We put those pictures on and we've never had trouble leasing our properties. So it hasn't been a real long time that you guys have owned the property, but what are rents when you guys bought it and what are rents today? So great question. The rents initially were anywhere from nine fifty up to ten thirty five. There were a couple of people paying ten thirty five. Now all the rents are were we jumped it up to like the, the very okay. first month was ten twenty five. I mean because as soon as we took it over, somebody moved out. Right. Mm-hmm. And and it was like, okay, what should we do? So let's let's try ten twenty five. The rents were ten thirty five on a couple. No, ten fifty. We went to ten fifty. We went to first 10 one, fifty. Right. But we only did twenty five dollars on rubs. We were experimenting with these things and try and we, we had it rented within yeah, a pulling, week. Pulling levers back and yes. forth to kind of yes. figure out how's this going to work. How's this going to work in October? Yeah, right. Then the next month, somebody else moved out. We we, we, raised, we, it we raised it a little more, and now we're up to ten sixty. Ten sixty in rent. rents, and we're up to instead of thirty dollars on rubs, we're forty five or forty. Yeah. And then we're charging for pets and all these different things. We've been able to raise the income just in nine months by f- about 6%. Are you pushing a distribution out to your investors yet? Great question. We are not yet. We promised everybody that we would within a year. And as you were all aware, taxes are yeah. an issue. We had just gotten our tax notice and they increased our taxes 52%. Yep. Yeah. So we're actually in a position, I think, within the next month or two that we will start paying earlier than we thought and and probably at a level a little bit higher than what we originally promised. Are you fighting the taxes? Are you, we are. If you've hired an attorney yeah. service to go out there exactly. and, and try to fight it to try to get it down to 10% or 20% yes. higher Yes, just to try yes. to find it. Right. And there's a cost to do it, but it's a better to try to put that cost into hiring an attorney to do it than actually paying the bill. 
long term. Long term. Yes, because it went up time. like four hundred and fifty dollars a door per year. Yeah, that, that's a big raise, and that's yeah one of the problems you have in the state of Texas and, and all these counties is that they're looking for for buckets to fill, and the first thing they do to go is when every property changes hands, they step up the basis in the deal, and they come back and they tag you on that, and right. so you got to fight the property taxes. It's a huge line item, and it, yeah. does, it can affect your NOI significantly. How about insurance? Are you guys doing okay with insurance? We are doing good in insurance. So one of the what, what, that there were several things that we wanted to focus on when we took over the property. We, we could see that some of the expenses were high. Yep. Like we, we've been able to cut the water bill by over 60% just by installing water conservation things. And, and then also by the rubs. I think once you start charging people something, they all of a sudden get just a little bit more conservative. We cut the garbage trash in half. Laurel negotiated a contract with them. We cut 25% off of our insurance bill. Which I know normally it goes the other way, but we were able to negotiate that. So. Wow, good deal. Any surprises or, hey, ahas? I, I know you, you, it, it's, it's been a, a huge learning experience, but what are top two or three things that you would say were big surprises or learning points? Well, one of our biggest surprises was we knew we had some roof work. They had told us that when we had done our due diligence mm-hmm. and had the roof inspected that there would be a few minor things that needed to be done, but we ended up with a leak, found out that there had been a fire on the roof. Really? Mm -hmm. And they had to strip off all the way down past the Replace some of the floor joist or the roof joist, because it's a flat roof. So what they had, somebody had done years ago, and we're talking maybe 20, maybe. Sure. But but they had just put new decking over that and patched Mm. it. So and, you came back and did it the right way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Good. So that was probably our biggest, our surprise, biggest surprise that was a kind of an expense yeah. that we hadn't yeah. planned for. Everything else pretty much has fallen in line. We haven't mm-hmm. had too many other surprises. Right. I think some of the other surprises were good surprises in the fact that even though we had 60% of our leases that were going to expire, we were able to rent those up and increase and really achieve our plan much quicker than we had originally thought. Right, we we're only nine months in, and we're we're actually up above our two year performa goals on Ooh, income. Fantastic, yeah. So, so Ricardo did a bank loan for you, yeah. Because, and let's talk a little bit about that and where you got your comfort level from doing a, a recourse bank loan. And uh, Ricardo, tell us a little bit about yeah. the loan itself, and then we'll ask them the yeah. questions. We talk a lot about how hey, non recourse is is great, and and when we can do it, we do it. All the time, but this was a smaller loan, and you had a very specific exit strategy. So recourse was really the the only option. How'd you get comfortable with that? We were never uncomfortable with that. We had been involved enough in some of these other passive deals. We'd been KPs. We felt very comfortable. We were very comfortable with you, Ricardo, and Old Capital, that you would be able to steer us in the right way. We love the bank that we are Mm -hmm. working with. They've been excellent to work with. We've never been uncomfortable. We had a lot of faith in ourselves and in our lifestyle education that we could do this. I was very nervous, very nervous at first, was not sleeping because I thought we've got other people's money and what if we can't make this work? But I, we were never uncomfortable with the recourse. We knew we could make it work. And, and we had it's, lots and it's of a great loan because it's, uh, the, like you said, there's a lot of flexibility. It's, a, it's a five-year loan, but there's no prepayment penalty mm-hmm. if we pay off the loan. Yeah. There is a prepayment penalty if we try to refinance it, but but no prepayment. If you pay it off, no. Yeah, no, yeah, no. But none if we pay it off. So it's, it gives us a lot of flexibility for uh, moving mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. And the, like like I said, yeah. it's independent bank, and they've been a great partner with mm-hmm. us. Yeah. We're able to go in with good leverage. I think we got about 75% leverage on the deal Yeah, with your rehab included in the transaction. Right. Mm-hmm. And again, the big thing for you was you wanted flexibility on the exit. So no prepayment structure, right. which is going to help you on the back end. Yeah. So what's next? You've gone through, you've kind of executed your game plan. You said you're you're, you're way ahead of that. Mm -hmm. You're about to start paying dividends to your investors. What are you guys up to next? We are on the hunt for our next property. So we're excited about that. It seems like we have more opportunities come our way now than we did the first time. Mm -hmm. And so we're excited about that opportunity as well or that possibility. that, That really is amazing is because once that you're into the game, that you actually own 
a real estate piece, you get a chip at the table, and a lot of the brokers see that you're committed to getting these transactions done and that uh, they will start offering you the ability to buy other properties. Uh, before you were an untapped person that uh, had never done it, so they were kind of afraid maybe that if they chose you that, that you couldn't get it done. But now since you you own a property, now you have a chip at the table, and they're more likely to, to start showing you and giving you more opportunities. So it's just an arranged thing range of, of unit size, would you go from 50 to 100, someplace in between? Is that something? That- exactly. We don't want to have anything underneath 50. Yeah. We're, we're not it, looking it, at anything it, there. And, and if it was 100, that would be great as would well. Would you think about trying to self-manage or would you try to get uh, a management company in the deal? You know, I think at this point, we would probably try to work out some kind of a hybrid situation with a management company. Yeah, because Laurel, who's good at that, she, I would imagine that she... Uh, would want to put those duties over to a management company to do it. But also for you as an asset manager, on behalf of the partnership and the responsibility of the partnership, you could oversee and see with making sure the management company is doing their thing. And so when when I take a look at you and your resume and things like that, you have a, a thing behind your name. Both of you guys have a little thing behind your name that says uh, IROP. What does that IROP mean? It's independent rental operator. We both got IROP certified. That's another way we got educated is we joined the apartment association and became IROPs so that we would have that additional education. What is that? Is that a test? Is it going through conferences? I mean... Oh, wow. It was a... Was it a two-day or a one-day class? I think it was a two-day class. Two-day class. With with a test at the end. Yeah. With a test that we And that's usually done through the, the independent apartment association. So if you are in Houston... You were in Chicago. A lot of these cities have an apartment association. Would you recommend belonging to an apartment association just to kind of understand about what's going on in the sub market and maybe compare notes with other small apartment investors? That and the fact that we can use the Texas Association apartment lease. Ah, mm. that's that's a good so that's a good benefit. So yes. Oh, it's great. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and their their resources. Yeah, the uh, propagated lease. Uh, Blank lease, you can use that, that mostly everybody uses, but you can use that legally if you're part of the Texas Apartment Association. Correct. Because that's what it says at the bottom of the lease that this was provided to you from them. So that's great because that, that lease is held up in court. It's great for fair housing and people you know can stand, stand behind it. I'm going to take this out of Ricardo's mouth. Any funny stories on <laughs> owning real estate, whether it's your properties or you've been an investor in properties or... Your single family business prior to this? Oh, wow. We've had a lot of experiences and funny stories in our single family before we joined Lifestyles. Had some many purple Martians that have, we've lost some money, made some money, but had crazy, crazy people, a lady that declared bankruptcy. So we lost three months of rent. But our best, best story is with this last little property, we got a dog out of it. Oh, Um, really? We were doing due diligence, and Alan was had his clipboard, and he was doing really good with his due diligence and doing what he was supposed to be, but I'm an animal lover. So I was saying hi to all the animals, and we went into this apartment, and there was a little shaggy mop. Alan called her a moving mop, who was in a cage, <laughs> cage underneath the sink, underneath this little table. And I said, what a cute dog this was, and the lady said, do you want her? And I said, are you serious? And she said, yes, I have to take her out twice a day. Oh, boy. So we finished due diligence. I went back and I said, are you sure? She said, yes. She handed me all the stuff. We got a little dog. She already had a bag with all of the <laughs> leashes and some dog food and stuff. She was ready to get I rid said, of this I said, won't animal. you miss her? And she said, yeah, but I'll get over it. And I went, oh my gosh. So I took the little <clears throat> dog home, took her to my groomer the very next day. Cutest little thing ever. Our son had been in California, had been looking for a dog just like her. She's a little Shih Tzu mix. And two months later, we went out to watch him swim from Alcatraz across the San Francisco Bay, and we took him a dog. Oh, no kidding. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that's a great story. So, and we just got to go visit her and our kids <laughs> this last weekend. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. And, you know, the lady is so nice about it. Oh, she's she's still a renter. Mm-hmm. And every time I see her, I show her pictures of Izzy, and Izzy. She's, she's just happy that we took care of her. Fantastic story. So... You've got a great you know, schedule of real estate, 22, 23 passive investments. Your first one kind of in the books. You're on the hunt for the next one. 
Talk a little bit more about your box. You said 50 units and above. What else? What are the two, two or three key things that you're looking for with the next property? So again, I think we we would like to find something similar to what we did on the first one. Something that was fairly stabilized, going to have some deferred maintenance probably, but in the DFW Metroplex, mm-hmm. meaning Dallas, Fort Worth, or adjoining cities that are close by. And um, that that's going to show maybe some additional opportunities as well. Some somebody that has been a good operator, but maybe conservative, <laughs> that that gives us to do maybe uh, the ability to do some of the things that that we've done with Villa Casita, but on a larger scale. Looking back three, four, five years ago, before you got into multifamily, and now being in multifamily, you've owned a number of, of properties. You've been partners in properties, just like uh, Ricardo just mentioned. Any advice to people thinking about getting into multifamily? Is this the right time to become an owner of multifamily? Is it, did they pass, was it two, three years ago? I mean, give us some, some ideas if it is a good time and any advice you would have for somebody that's, that's new coming into the business. I think several years ago, almost anybody could get a property and, and make money with it. Sure. I think now it's a little tighter. I think you've got to be a good operator. You've got to know what you're doing, and you've really got to be on top of it to make some of these deals really profitable. So I think you're going to see some separation at this point. I still think the market's great. The DFW area has so many people moving into it. There's such a huge variety of jobs that I think it's still going to be a great market to be in. I do think people need to be careful, but I think there's lots of opportunities and I think it's growing and and we're not nervous about it at all. Right. The key though, is that education, learning, networking, 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 build your team, build your team. Yeah, absolutely. Some, uh, some great advice. Anything more to add, Ricardo? No. No. Fantastic (laughs) stuff. We appreciate, uh, appreciate you joining us. Well, thanks for having us. Um, fantastic story. And we're looking forward to, hearing a lot more about what, uh, what's to come. So tell us if somebody wanted to get a little bit more information about what you guys do and kind of understand, maybe reach out to you. Is there an email address that uh, you'd want them to contact you at? Yes, certainly. It's a little bit lengthy, so but it's uh, it has to do with our name and so on. But uh, So our uh, B-E-A-Z-W-O-R-K-Z investing so bees works investing at gmail.com so that's a that's a good one that's that's a mouthful <laughs> if you if you gotta write that down you can just replay the last 10 seconds on the yeah. podcast and you, you can write it down again yeah because i think we're gonna if, be if we were gonna change anything we probably would have changed that from the start but now we're far enough in that it's like now you can't tough tough to change yeah. Yeah. yeah that is tough and i know we're you know we're looking in the future to get another deal very quickly and then a bigger one after that. So we're just going to keep progressing. Yeah. You guys have done it the absolute right way. Single family to uh, multifamily passive investing, did a number of those transactions. Now you've done your first and looking to do your second multifamily lead sponsor ownership role. Very happy for you guys continue to do the, the great work that you guys do. So again, thanks to the Beezers. Thanks for being in and spending some time with us today. Ricardo, always a pleasure. We appreciate that. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.